Let us share with you our hopes and our challenges in trusting each to God. Pope Francis, your brother bishops extend to you our fraternal embrace and our heartfelt gratitude for your presence among us. Carissimi fratelli nell'Episcopato, innanzitutto, io vorrei all, inviare un saluto I would alla like comunità ebrea. To send my greetings to the Hebrew community, to our Jewish brothers, for whom today is a sacred day, Yom Kippur. I hope the Lord brings down his blessings of peace and will keep them in life and holiness according to the word of the Lord we have heard, heard today. Be holy, for I am holy. I am pleased to meet you at this point in the apostolic mission that has brought me to your country. I would deeply like to thank Cardinal Well and Archbishop Kurtz for their kind words, words that were also in your name. Please take aboard my appreciation for your welcome and generous efforts to plan and organize my stay I look out with affection at you, the pastors, and in doing so, I would like to embrace all the local churches that you lovingly carry on your shoulders. And I would ask you to reassure them that my human and spiritual closeness makes us all one people of God throughout this vast land. The heart of the Pope expands to include everyone, expanding the heart to bear witness that God is great in his love, is this very essence of the missions of Peter's succession. The vicar of the one who on the cross embraced the whole of mankind. May no member of Christ's body or the American people feel excluded from the Pope's embrace. Wherever the name of Jesus is spoken, May the Pope's voice also be heard there 
to affirm that he is the savior from your great eastern coastal cities to the plains of the midwest from the deep south to the far reaches of the west wherever your people gather in the eucharistic assembly may the pope not simply be a name invoked out of habit, but a real tangible presence to sustain the fervent plea of the bride. Come, Lord. When a hand reaches out to do good or to show a brother the love of Christ, to dry a tear, or comfort the lonely, to show the way to one who is lost, or to console a broken heart, to help the fallen, or teach those thirsting for truth, to forgive or offer a new start in God. Know that the Pope is by your side, the Pope supports you. He also puts his hand on yours, a hand wrinkled with age, but by God's grace is still able to support and encourage. My first word is thanksgiving to God for the power of the gospel which has allowed this remarkable growth of Christ's church in these lands and enabled its generous contribution that the church has offered in the past and in the present to the American society and the world. I thank you most heartily and really appreciate your generous solidarity with the apostolic see and the support you give to the spread of the gospel in many areas of the world where there is suffering. I appreciate the unfailing commitment of the church in America to the cause of life and the family. The primary reason for this visit of mine I follow closely the immense efforts you have made to welcome and integrate immigrants who continue to look to America like so many others before them in the hope of enjoying its blessing of freedom and prosperity. I also admire the effort with, with which you are making, which you're making to fulfill the church's mission of education in schools at every level and the charitable services that you offer in your numerous institutions. These works are often carried out without appreciation or support of their real value and often with heroic sacrifice maintained with the arms of the poor because these initiatives grow out of obedience to a divine mandate which we may not disobey. I am conscious of the courage with which you have faced difficult moments in the recent history of the ecclesiastical path without fear of self-criticism and at the cost of mortification and great sacrifice 
without giving in to the fear of giving up everything that is superfluous as long as you can regain the authority and trust that is demanded of Christ's ministers as the soul of your people demands. I know how much the wounds of these last few years have weighed on your spirit and I have joined my efforts to yours in the efforts of succoring those victims and when we bring succor then the victims are healed and we have to hope that such crimes will never repeat themselves. I speak to you as the Bishop of Rome already in old age but called by God and coming from a land which is also American to watch over the unity of the universal church and to encourage in charity the journey of all the particular churches so that they may grow in knowledge, faith, and love of Christ. Reading over your names, looking at your faces, knowing the extent of your churchmanship and conscious of the devotion with which you have always, which you have always shown for the successor of Peter, I must tell you that I do not feel a stranger among your midst. I come from a land which is also vast, with great open ranges, a land which, like your own, received the faith from itinerant missionaries. I know how hard it is to sow the gospel among people from different worlds whose hearts are often hardened by the trials of a lengthy journey. I am not unaware of the efforts made over the years to build up the church amid prairies, mountains, cities, and suburbs of a frequently inhospitable land where frontiers are always provisional and easy answers do not always work and the key to open the door means you have to combine the epic struggle of the pioneers and the homely wisdom and endurance of the settlers who defend the land they reached. As one of your poets has put it, strong and tireless wings combined with the wisdom of one who knows the mountains. I do not speak to you with my voice alone but rather in continuity with the words of my predecessors. From the very birth of this nation, nation, when following the American Revolution, the first diocese, well, diocese was erected in Baltimore, the Church of Rome has always been close to you. You have never lacked its constant assistance and encouragement. In recent decades, three popes, three of my venerable predecessors have visited you, leaving behind a remarkable legacy of teaching, which is still very valid. 
and you have treasured the words to help inspire the long-term goals with which you had set forth the church, this beloved church in this country. It is not my intention to offer you a plan or devise for you a strategy. I have not come to judge you or to lecture you. I fully trust the voice of the one who teaches all things. Allow me only in the freedom of love to speak to you as a brother amongst brothers. I do not wish to tell you what to do because we all know what it is that the Lord asks of us. I would much rather turn once again to that demanding task, ancient yet ever new, of seeking out the paths we need to take and the spirit with, with which we need to work and keeping and the feelings we might keep we must keep alive without claiming to be exhaustive I would share with you some thoughts which I consider helpful for our mission. We are the bishops of the church, shepherds appointed by God to feed his flock. Our greatest joy is to be shepherds and only shepherds Shepherds with undivided hearts and selfless devotion. We need to preserve this joy and never let others rob us of it. The evil one roars like a lion trying to devour it, wearing us down in our resolve to be all that we are called to be, not for ourselves, but in gifts and service to the shepherd of our souls. The heart of our identity is to be sought in constant prayer, in preaching, and in shepherding the flock. Ours must not just be any kind of prayer, but a familiar union with Christ, in which we daily encounter his gaze and sense that he is asking us the question, who is, your who is my mother? Who are my brothers? One to which we calmly reply, Lord, here is your mother, here are your brothers. I hand them over to you. They are the ones you entrusted to me. Such trusting union with Christ is what nourishes the life of a pastor and a shepherd. It is not about preaching complicated doctrines, but joyfully proclaiming Christ, who died and rose for our sake. The style of our mission, mission suscita make our hearers in quanti feel ci ascoltano la esperienza. The message we preach is meant for us. May the Word of God grant meaning and fullness to every aspect of their lives. May the sacraments nourish them with that food which they cannot produce for themselves. May the closeness of the shepherd make them long once again for the Father's embrace.
Be vigilant that the flock may always encounter in their heart and in the heart of their pastor that taste of eternity which they vainly seek in the things of, these, of this world. May they always hear from you a word of appreciation for their efforts to confirm in liberty and justice the prosperity in which this land abounds. At the same time, though, you should never lack the serene courage to proclaim that we must work not for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures for eternal life. Shepherds who do not pasture themselves, but are able to step back and down, away from the center, to feed God's family with Christ. Keeping constant watch, standing on the heights to look out with God's eyes, on the flock that belongs only to him, ascending to the height of the cross of God's Son, the only standpoint which opens to the shepherd the heart of his flock. Shepherds who do not lower our gaze concerned only with our concerns and self-reference, but raising it constantly towards the horizons which God opens before us and surpass all that we ourselves can foresee or plan. Watching also over ourselves to flee the temptation of narcissism, which blinds the eyes of the shepherd, making his voice unrecognizable and his actions fruitless. In the countless paths which lie open, to your pastoral concerns. Remember to keep focus on the core which unifies everything. You did it unto me. It certainly helps for a bishop to have the far-sightedness of a leader and the shrewdness of an administrator. But we fall into hopeless decline whenever we confuse the power of strength with the strength of that powerlessness with which God has redeemed us. A bishop needs to be lucidly aware of the battle between light and darkness being fought in the world. Woe to us, however, if we make of the cross a banner of worldly struggles and fail to realize that the price of lasting victory is allowing ourselves to be wounded and consumed. We all know the anguish felt by the first 11 huddled together, assailed, and overwhelmed by the fear of sheep shattered because the shepherd had been struck. But we also know that we have been given a spirit of courage, not of timidity. So, we cannot let ourselves be paralyzed by fear. 
I know full well that you face many challenges and that often you work in an unyielding field and you try that you try to sow and that there are many temptations to be closed in the gates of fear and licking your wounds and thinking back to bygone times and devise harsh responses to fierce opposition and yet we are promoters of the culture of encounter. We are living sacraments of the embrace between God's divine riches and our poverty. We are witnesses of the abasement and condescension of God who anticipates in love our every response. Dialogue is our method, not as a shrewd strategy, but out of fidelity to the one who never wearies of going out to people, even at the 11th hour, to propose his offer of love. The path ahead, therefore, is a dialogue. Dialogue among yourselves, dialogue in your presbyterates, dialogue with lay persons, with families, dialogue with society. I shall never tire of encouraging you to dialogue fearlessly. The richer the heritage which you are called to share with Parisia, the more eloquent should be the humility with which you should offer it. Do not be afraid to set out on the exodus necessary for all authentic dialogue. Otherwise, it will not be possible to understand the thinking of others or realize deep down that the brother or sister we wish to reach and redeem with the power and closeness of love counts more than their positions, distant as they may be from what we hold as a true and certain. Harsh and divisive language does not befit the tongue of a shepherd. It has no place in his heart. Although momentarily it may seem to win the day, only the enduring allure of goodness and love remained through truly convincing. We need to let the Lord's word echo constantly in our hearts. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me who am meek and humble of heart, and you will find refreshment for your soul. Jesus' yoke is a yoke of love, and thus a pledge of refreshment. At times in our work, we can feel burdened down by a sense of loneliness, and feel the heaviness of the yoke, so much so that we forget that we've received it from the Lord. At times, it seems to be ours alone, and so we drag it like weary oxen working a dry field, troubled by the thought that we are laboring in vain. We can forget the profound refreshment 
which is indissolubly linked to the one who has made us the promise. We need to learn from Jesus, or better, to learn Jesus, meek, humble, to enter his meekness and his humility by contemplating his way of acting, to lead our churches and our people not infrequently burdened by the stress of everyday life to the ease of the Lord's yoke and to remember that the identity of Jesus' church is kept whole not by consuming fire from heaven, but by the secret warmth of the Spirit who heals what is wounded, bends what is rigid, straightens what is crooked. The great mission which the Lord gives us is one which we carry out in communion, collegially, the world is already so torn up and divided. Brokenness is to be found everywhere nowadays. And therefore the church, the seamless garment of the Lord, cannot allow herself to be rent, broken or fall over. Our mission as bishops is first and foremost to solidify unity, a unity whose content is defined by the word of God and the one bread of heaven. And with these two realities, each of the churches entrusted to us remains Catholic because open to and in communion with all the particular churches and the Church of Rome, which presides in charity. It is thus imperative to watch over that unity, safeguard it, promote it, and bear witness to it as a sign and instrument which, beyond every barrier, unites nations, races, classes, and generations. May the forthcoming holy year of mercy, by drawing us into the fathomless depths of God's heart in which no division dwells, before you all a privileged moment for strengthening communion, perfecting unity, reconciling differences, forgiving one another and healing every rift that your light may shine forth like a city built on a hill. This service to unity is particularly important for your beloved nation whose vast material and spiritual resources, as well as the cultural and political, historical and human, scientific and technological ones, impose significant moral responsibilities in a world which is confusedly seeking new balances of peace, prosperity, and integration. It is therefore an essential part of your mission to offer to the United States of America a humble yet powerful leaven of communion. May all mankind know that the presence in its midst of the sacrament of unity is a guarantee that its fate is not decay and dispersion. This kind of witness is a beacon whose light can never go out. 
and can reassure men and women sailing through the dark clouds of life because they need to be guided by this light to be sure that a ha haven awaits them to be sure that they will not crash on the reefs or be overwhelmed by the waves. And therefore, my brothers, I encourage you to face the challenging issues of our time. Within each of these challenges is life as a gift and as responsibility. The future of freedom and dignity of our societies depends on how we will face these challenges. The innocent victims of abortion, the children who die of hunger or from bombings, the immigrants who drown in search for a better tomorrow, the elderly or the sick who are considered a burden, the victims of terrorism, wars, violence and drug trafficking, the environment devastated by man's predatory relationship with nature, at stake in all of this is always the gift of God, of which we are noble stewards, not masters. It is wrong, then, to look the other way or remain silent. No less important is the gospel of the family, which in the world meeting of families in Philadelphia that I'm about to embark on, I will emphatically proclaim together with you and the entire church. These essential aspects of the church's mission belong to the core of what we have received from the Lord. It is therefore our duty to preserve and communicate them, even when the tenor of the times resists and becomes hostile to that message. I urge you to offer this witness with the means and creativity born of love and with the humility of truth. This ne witness needs to be preached and proclaimed to those without, but it also needs to find room in people's hearts and in the conscience of society. To this end, it is very important that the Church in the United States be also a humble heart attracting men and women with the allure of its light and the warmth of its love. As shepherds, we know how much darkness and cold are still out there in the world. We know the loneliness and neglect experienced by many, even amidst great resources of communication and material wealth. We also know their fear in the face of life, their despair, and the many forms of escapism that it gives rise to. Therefore, only a church which can gather around the hearth remains able to attract others, but not any fire. It needs to be the one which blazed forth on the Easter morn. It is the risen Lord who continues to challenge the church's pastors through the quiet plea of so many of our brothers and sisters. Have you something to eat? We need to recognize the Lord's voice as the apostles did on the shore of the lake of Tiberias. 
it becomes even more urgent to grow in the certainty that the embers of his presence kindled in the fire of his passion precede us and will never die out whenever this certainty weakens then we risk ending up being caretakers of ash and no longer guardians and dispensers of the true light and the warmth that enables our hearts to burn within us. Before concluding, allow me to proffer two recommendations which are close to my heart. The first has to do with your fatherhood as bishops. Be pastors and shepherds close to the people, pastors who are neighbors and servants. Let this closeness be expressed in a special way towards your priests. Support them so that they may continue to serve Christ with an undivided heart. For this alone can bring fulfillment to ministers of Christ. I urge you then, do not let them be content with half measures. Find ways to encourage the spiritual growth, lest they yield to temptation to become notaries and bureaucrats, but instead reflect the motherhood of the church, which gives birth to and raises her sons and daughters. Be vigilant, lest they tire of getting up to answer those who knock on their door at night, just as they think that they deserve a rest, train them to be ready to stop, bend down, care for, soothe, lift up, and assist those who, by chance, find themselves stripped of all they thought they had. My second recommendation has to do with immigrants. Please excuse me if I almost speak for myself. The United States Church knows better than others the hopes in the hearts of these pilgrims. From the beginning, you have learned their languages, promoted their cause, made their contributions your own, defended their, their rights, helped them to prosper and keep alive the flame of their faith. Even today, no American institution does more for immigrants than your Christian communities. You are now facing this long stream of Latin immigration which affects so many of your dioceses. Not only as a bishop of as the Bishop of Rome, but also as a pastor coming from the South. I feel the need to thank you and to encourage you. Perhaps it will not be easy for you to read their soul. Perhaps you will be tested by their diversity. But rest assured and keep in mind that they also possess resources meant to be shared. And so Open your arms and welcome to them and welcome them without fear. Offer them the warmth and love of Christ and you will unlock the mystery of their hearts. 
I am certain that once again, these people will enrich America and its church. May God bless you and Our Lady watch over you. Thank you. Well, that was very nice.